Okay. Uh, um, all right. So back to where we are in the book, almost the same place as last time. Um, it was in the of the continental aesthetic. And the continental logic. And this has two parts. Analytic. I'm not going to write the self part to the analytic anymore. Oh, that's fine. And then this is a dialectic. This has two parts. The uh, concepts of pure reason and the dialectical instances of pure reason. Um, so the reading for this time we finished this and uh, and then just look at this just like an introductory section of this. Um, so um, yeah, I wanted to start by uh, going back a little bit more carefully about what the different relations of judgment are and what that means about the different types of syllogisms. Because I think uh, that's important to understand at least as best as we can why um, the three relations of judgment lead to the three transcendental ideas that they do and why those transcendental ideas are involved in the, in the illusions that they're involved in. Um, um, I say as best as we can because I like, as with many other parts of this book, there's still things there I don't understand very well. <laughs> um, but I'm going to do the best I can to to try to make it make sense. So, um, so the, right, so the three relations of judgment are categorical. No, maybe it's the Categorical, hypothetical, and disjunctive. Um, um, and the reason I wanted to write them this way is to, you know, recall that they are somewhere in that table of categories, and these are the three moments of relation. Um, that is, well, okay, in the table of judgment, which corresponds to the table of categories. Actually, so the categories that correspond to these are substance, accident, cause, effect, and community, or I mean, Um, Kant actually says um, that uh, the proper Latin equivalent, the German word he's using, is not communitas, but commercium. So, um, but you can see why, given what commerce usually means in English, people don't nevertheless don't translate it as commerce. But it, it's, uh, it's about the mutual interactions of all the substances to make up a consistent world. Uh, so, uh, so, so like, what are these three relations of judgment about and how are they related to those three categories? So, right, so a, a categorical judgment is a judgment like all really is evil, you know, like all cinnabar is red or all bodies are changeable is an example that Kant uses in this section. Um,
So, I mean, when you say this about cinnabar, if it's not um, analytic, so if it's analytic, you're saying something about your own subject subjective um, conditions for thinking cinnabar, right? Like this is part of what I think when I think cinnabar. But if it's not analytic, if it's synthetic, um, then um, you're claiming that uh, somewhere within the whole experience that is like the object of your concept cinema is something that has to be there that makes it red. So like, here's the object of the concept cinema. It's like all the cinema. <laughs> of course, we don't we don't ever represent it that way as print, right? That's why I said it's it's something like as far as you go with cinema, right? Um, that's what that's what the category of unity is about. That makes universal judgment possible. It's about regarding cinema as one wherever it might be, right? So, um, but the point is, you know, so I have a concept cinema. That at least on the simple way of thinking about concepts, this concept consists of a list of characteristics. Um, and if something displays those characteristics, I'm gonna count it as cinema. And if it doesn't, I'm not gonna count it as cinema. Um, so, um, assuming this is a valid empirical concept, that is, that I've derived it from experience, um, then at least normally, I mean, I don't think, I can't, may not give sufficient attention to the things that could go wrong here, but, um, at least normally, you formed the concept by experiencing something that has those characteristics, right? That's how you got an empirical concept in the first place. So it definitely is something that has those characteristics. And this concept captures that wherever it might be. So it gets all of it. Um, but of course, um, it only represents it as having those characteristics, not anything else. Now we use it as the subject of a categorical judgment. And again, supposing this judgment is synthetic, because if it's analytic, then all I'm doing is taking one of those characteristics out and saying, hey, since the way I gathered this stuff together to be considered as one is by checking it against this list of characteristics, of course it all has this characteristic that's on the list, right? It has to, right? So again, that's about like what I did in here. <laughs> but supposing it's synthetic, so now I'm saying that um, whatever is captured by this concept, as far as you go with it, is always going to be B. Um, so, um, on what grounds am I claiming that, <laughs> right? I mean, it's not on anything about me. It must be something about cinema. And it must be something that's internal to cinema in the sense that it's part of what makes cinema possible, <laughs> right? That is part of what makes some, it possible for someone to display these, something to display these characteristics. Again, not subjectively possible, right? Like from my point of view, all you need to display these characteristics is to display these characteristics. But if I say that everything that does it is B, then I'm saying that there's something about the object. And what is the object? The object is everything that displays these characteristics 
by saying that some that something about it that's internal to it that makes it possible to do what it does also makes it be. So this is about an in, it's an internal condition. Right? Like we're we're um, applying a rule on a condition, and the condition is internal to the object of our concepts. And that's why no other concepts appear in this judgment. Right, there's only two concepts because um, the condition that allows me to apply this rule to whatever falls under this concept is somewhere in the object of the concept. That's what I'm claiming. Of course, if it's not true, then my judgment is is false, <laughs> right? Um, which obviously it can be, um, but. Um, but again, the question is like what I'm trying to do with the judgment like that, what I'm claiming. I'm claiming that somewhere in, not in the concept, but in the object of the concept is, is the condition that, that makes me apply. Whereas in a hypothetical judgment. So like, Again, it's hard to give a good example of this. Kant's example of hypothetical judgment is very not helpful, I find. Although there may be a reason this is the kind of example he gives, but Ray, the example he gives is, if there is perfect justice, then the obstinately wicked will be punished. <laughs> um, um, it's very not helpful because it's, those are not empirical judgments. Like if like there is perfect judgment, justice is not an empirical judgment. And the obstinately wicked will be punished. It could be taken as an empirical judgment, but if so, then it's definitely false. Sometimes the obstinately wicked are not punished. Right. So like to to make it even worthy of consideration, you have to mean, even though empirically we don't see them being punished, in some sense, in another life. Like, so, you know, that doesn't necessarily mean, like, it means regarded some way other than as the object of sensible intuition, I think, is what it means for college. So somehow, in another life, they are punished, <laughs> right? So those are not empirical conditions, so I can't really draw this picture, you know, but on the other hand, I'm not sure what, um, um, what kind of empirical example does Kant have in mind? But, you know, if I say something like, um, this is still not a great example for a number of reasons. If cinnabar contains mercury, then it is not. So, I mean, one reason this is not a great example is that cinnabar is the subject in both places, which in a general hypothetical judgment is not true, right? Like usually the general form of a hypothetical judgment is if C is B, then A is B, right? Like if there is perfect justice, which, what's the subject of that? Does that mean if the world is perfectly just or something like that? I don't know what the subject of that is, but anyway, the subject of that is not the obstinately wicked, right? So the obstinately wicked are punished. There's two concepts here, and then here there's two other concepts that are not either of those. Um, but um, but and this so that's one reason this isn't a great example. The other reason it's not a great example is that um, it turns like all cinnabar contains mercury. 
I think from that from my point of view, that is at least initially a synthetic term, right? Like again, I think empirical concepts don't have fixed definitions. So like we went into it thinking of cinnabar as something heavy and red and shiny or whatever. And then later on we learned that everything like that is mercury sulfide. And then our concept of cinnabar like maybe shifts to be mercury sulfide. <laughs> it's actually not all mercury sulfide is cinnabar. It depends on the crystal structure. There's something called meta cinnabar. But anyway, um, I, <laughs> I spent probably more time than I should reading the Wikipedia article about cinnabar. Um, <laughs> but um, um, but so, so this is not a great example for a number of reasons, but still you can kind of see what's going on from this example, because the point is like, um, we're thinking of, um, yeah. we're thinking of cinnabar as not all the same. Right, like we're thinking of it as plural. That's why it goes in this column, plurality. Right, we're thinking of cinnabar as like having different parts, everywhere different from itself, basically. And then we're saying, like, um, so, I mean, so by the way, another reason that's a great example. Maybe I'm looking at it wrong. Maybe I could say this is possible cinnabar. We're thinking of possible cinnabar as having different parts. I mean, the thing that's weird about this is like, Suppose what this means is like the cinnabar that contains mercury is toxic, and the cinnabar that doesn't contain mercury isn't toxic, right? Like you might say about something else, right? Like uh, if the thermometer contains mercury, right, then um, uh, it can be poisoned by it if it breaks or something like that. <laughs> um, uh, so, like, it's thinking. So, really, so, so I'm really like taking this to mean something like if this cinnabar contains mercury, then it is toxic. Maybe, you know, see, but the Hans example isn't like that. You know, if the world, if there is perfect justice, then the oxygen and the liquid are, are punished. Like, it's, there either is perfect justice everywhere or there isn't. <laughs> you know? um, it's not like some of the oxygen and liquid are punished, namely the ones where there's perfect justice. That's not what it means. So, Yeah, I guess, again, so you're drawing it wrong, and maybe um, maybe the transcendental illusion is somehow getting to me here, I'm not sure, or, or some problem that's related to it. If cinnabar contains mercury, then it is toxic. But what I'm really thinking about is, like, possible cinnabar. That is whatever possibly is the target of my concept, cinnabar, cinnabar, whatever possibly is its object. Um, so this this plurality here isn't the plurality of the parts of cinnabar in the world. This plur plurality is the plurality of like possible um, like completions of my concept of cinnabar, right? Like it's got a list of characteristics, possible other characteristics could be added to it. So 
So in the categorical judgment, um, I try to add a characteristic to all of it. And that's the sense in which it's internal. They, like I'm trying to say, um, as I put it before, part of what makes cinnabar possible, what makes it possible for cinnabar to be the object of my concept is whatever it is to be that I'm attributing to it. But in this case, I'm not saying that. Now, it might still be true, as maybe it is in this case, but that's not what I'm saying, right? What I'm saying is I can think of my concept as being completed by adding and contains mercury, or I can think of it as completed by adding and doesn't contain mercury. So I'm thinking of like possible cinnabar is divided into pieces. Like the logical space of cinnabar is divided into pieces. And like if that's true, then it's going to be divided into pieces by a condition that's external to the object of cinnabar. I mean, that is, it's not only external to my concept, but since I'm thinking of possible cinnabar itself as either having this characteristic or not, I'm saying having this characteristic, um, I, or at least I'm not asserting that having this characteristic is part of what it makes it possible to be cinnabar. Rather, I'm asserting that this characteristic is something external. So it applies to this part of cinnabar, but not to that part. And then I'm saying this external characteristic that's not part of cinnabar is what allows me to attach this predicate toxin to cinnabar. So I guess, yeah, I mean, when you draw it this way, you can understand a little bit better how Kant it applies even to the general case, right? It's like, think of this as possible world instead of possible cinnabar. And the external characteristic is It's perfectly just, sorry. So when I say, if perfect justice, there is perfect justice, that is, if the world is perfectly just, then the obstinately wicked will be punished. I'm saying, I'm thinking of my concept world as being possibly applying to something that has perfect justice, but on the other hand, possibly applying to something that doesn't have perfect justice. So I'm like dividing the logical space of world between the part that this external condition applies to and the part that it doesn't. We still don't have enough pieces here to get into obstinately wicked being punished. Right, so I should have drawn it this way. Possible obstinately wicked.
Right, and because of it, it's an external condition that it doesn't necessarily mention the object of the judgment at all. Right, when I say the object of the judgment, What the judgment is about is the object of A. Right? The judgment is saying about the obstinately wicked that if there is perfect justice, then they will be punished. Um, so, I mean, if we were saying that it was something about the obstinately wicked themselves that determined this, then it would be a categorical judgment. Um, uh, and there would only be two concepts. In it. But since we're saying it's not something about them themselves, it's something about something else. And there, therefore, there's room for two more concepts. What the something else is and what about it? <laughs> hey, right, so, so, so now, so what I'm saying is on this external condition, I've, I've divided the possible obstinately wicked into these two parts. And one of them, this external condition applies to, and the other one it doesn't. And then I'm using that as the condition on which to apply the rule is punished. Problem is, um, yeah, I can't think of good, like empirical examples like this. You know, like if cinnabar is red, then gold is heavy or something like that, right? Like, how would you get an example like that working? Um, but, but at least I think I can understand how if you did get an example like that working, it would it would fit this. Um, so that's the categorical judgment, right? So this is a rule applied on an external condition. Now, what's going on in the disjunctive judgment is even harder to understand, but I mean, it's basically, I mean, you can still, you can still kind of see it with the same picture. And I think I'm not actually I'm on the right track because it's good that this is a logical space, not like the kind of physical extent of cinema or something like that. So what happens in a disjunctive judgment is that we say, so to speak, that all the um, external conditions put together have to add up to the internal nature of cinema. Now, I mean, I think usually in the, or it's possible at least in the disjunctive judgment, that what the judgment is about isn't even mentioned in the judgment. Because what the judgment is, is about is like um, the sum total of possibility that depends on the external condition being either this or this. Right, so, so the disjunctive judgment is gonna be something like Either C is B or E is F, right? So we have, here's one external condition, C is B. Here's the other one, E is F. And we're saying that between them, um, they make up the whole sphere of possibility that we're talking about. That is, we're saying that we've got all the external conditions that there could be. And of course, so there can be more than two, and that's where the disjunctive judgment can go on, right? It says 
A hypothetical judgment contains two judgments, but a disjunctive judgment, judgment contains two or more, <laughs> right? So it can go on, or G is H, or whatever. But, you know, when we stop it, we're saying that we've got all of them. And so all of these pieces put together have to add up to the original unity. And that's why this is connected to the category of totality. Right, the category of totality is about plurality adding back up to one. Um, um, okay, so I probably spent a lot longer on that than I should have, and yet I think. Um, so, I mean, I don't know what to write here. It's like, you know, here I wrote internal condition, here I wrote external condition. This is about like, it's about the totality of possible conditions. And like, are these external or internal? Well, the answer is that each one by itself is external, but when you put them all together, they're internal. Um, right. So, um, For syllogism. So this is how I try to explain the difference between a judgment and a syllogism. I mean, do people understand what I'm drawing when I draw a picture? Probably not. Why do I draw a judgment looking like that? Right? This is the predicate and this is the subject. So in a categorical judgment, like this might be red and this might be cinnabar. And in the simplest case, where it's a universal categorical judgment, the judgment is all cinnabar is red. Right? And the reason I draw it this way is because, like, down here or out here is the manifold effects of the object on me. Right? The manifold is, is in sense. The manifold of sense. And um, this concept is being used to represent some part of that as all the same, as one. So this is the concept that's actually like going all the way down or out <laughs> to. Um, to, well, not directly to the object, right? Because I don't have an intellectual intuition, but to the, but to the intuition that's gonna, that's gonna, to the manifold of intuition that points to the object. I mean, it points to the object, again, really because the object points to me, right? It points to the object because the object affected me from some direction at some time. Um, and my like my reference is just following this arrow back to the objects. Um, but um, so anyway, right? So this is what the judgment looks like. Now, like, what's the difference between a judgment and a syllogism? I mean, like, there's different ways to answer that. I mean, obviously, a syllogism has three judgments, so it's not just a judgment, you might say. Yeah. I want the conclusion to be a
So a syllogism has three judgments. But Kant says that um, really, just like, you know, what is the object of this judgment? The object of this judgment is the object of the subject concept. That's what the judgment is about. So, like, what's equivalent to that in the syllogism is, is like, if you ask, what is the judgment of this syllogism? syllogism and the answer is that it's the conclusion. The conclusion is what the syllogism, so to speak, asserts. So, um, so one of the things Kant says about syllogism is that the syllogism is immediate judgment. It's a judgment where the predicate is passed to the subject by by means of the middle term C. So, like, so getting back to this question, what's the difference in a syllogism and a judgment? The answer is, um, from this point of view, that a syllogism is a judgment, but it's a judgment with something else, so to speak, making the connection to it. And the something else is, in the case of a categorical judgment, is the middle term C. Right, so if, if you say, every compound of mercury is toxic, but all cinnabar is a compound of mercury, Therefore, all cinnabar is toxic. Um, where the predicate of the judgment of the, the predicate of the syllogism is B, and the subject of the syllogism is A, right? So, like what the what the syllogism is about is cinnabar. And what it says about cinnabar is that it's toxic. But it says that it's toxic, toxic by way of this condition being a compound of mercury. And that, con that condition um, is, uh, is, I'm using this form of explanation of why A is B, I'm thinking of that condition as internal to A. And, you know, that's why the major premise is a categorical judgment. Um, so, um, but this can be a picture of any kind of solution. I mean, or at least, okay, again, it's easier to say it in the case of a hypothetical syllogism. In the case of a disjunctive syllogism, it's again going to be hard to say, it seems, but this is a disjunctive syllogism. I mean, sorry, a hypothetical syllogism. Yeah. Major premise, if C is B, then A is B. Minor premise, C is B. Conclusion, A is B. So it's the same judgment. What's different is the, the, the condition that I'm using to assert it. Now the condition is not something internal to A, it's something else. So it's a different way of explaining, right? As, as I said last time, Kant thinks of the syllogism, the point of this mediation is that rather than just asserting that A is B, you're getting an explanation by A is B. Now, 
you might not have an explanation for a judgment. So in that case, you can assert it, but you can't explain it. Right? So, like, you know, um, before Daltonian chemistry, blah, 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 when we didn't know that cinnabar was a top out of mercury. <laughs> um, let's say, I mean, I don't know what they thought about cinnabar at what stage. But anyway, like, let's say, when we didn't know that cinnabar was a compound of mercury. I, I guess what they would have thought is that the Histon theory is that mercury is a compound of cinnabar. But all right, never mind that. <laughs> the point is, like, if like if you don't know that about it, you can still assert that it's all toxic on the basis of experiments. But um, you can't explain it, and um, until you find the explanation. You can't really be sure that, um, so to speak, that it's one fact that you're talking about, right? Because as I said last time, like it could be that some cinnabar is toxic for one reason, and other cinnabar is toxic for another reason. Um, you know, like so until you have some kind of condition. Um, uh, your judgment has the unity of the understanding, as Todd says, but it doesn't have the unity of reason. The unity of understanding is just applying the rule everywhere that the condition holds. But the unity of reason is explaining, in every case, the same way why the rule holds when the, when the condition holds. So, Right, and so I'm saying like the difference in the hypothetical judgment and uh, categorical judgment is just what kind of explanation you're giving. Um, disjunctive judgment means I'm sorry, disjunctive syllogism. Right, this is how disjunctive syllogism works. So you like the premise is a disjunctive, the major premise is a disjunctive judgment. The minor premise is negative. It says that one of the disjuncts is false. And I, as I think I mentioned a long time ago, this is this or in disjunctive judgment is supposed to be exclusive or right. I think that was clear in the picture actually, but um, right. So like in, in most or exactly one of these is true, is what it means. They can't both be true, right? So the disjunctive syllogism says, well, this one isn't true. They can't, sorry, I just said the other one. But anyway, the, the disjunctive syllogism says, well, this one isn't true. Therefore, this one must be true. Right? Because again, like we have all the possible external conditions. So if we eliminate some of them, we must be left with. The other one, right? And so if this has more disjunct, then this would also have to be disjunctive, right? You have to say not E is F or other things. Um, so in this case, again, I think the subject concept here is kind of like. Or the, like the subject we're trying to apply a rule to is not really stated in the judgment, but it's something like the case at hand, what we're talking about, right? And you know, the the rule is really going to be uh, the conclusion, and the condition is.
right? So like just as in the other cases, the thing that's repeated here is the condition. Only in this case, it's a it's a negative condition, right? Like because not this. That's why the only thing we have left that could apply to the case at the end is the other one. Um, So, like, the logical employment of reason, I think, I mean, step back to the logical employment of the understanding for a second. So the logical employment of the understanding is to, like, apply one concept on the condition of another. Um, or more generally, like, I mean, well, let me stick to a categorical judgment. <laughs> Otherwise, it's going to get really complicated. So, like, in a categorical judgment, the, the logical function of the understanding is to apply one judgment, one concept on the condition of another. Why is that logic? Because it's that it's formal, it belongs to formal logic. Part of this, what formal general logic studies? Well, like it's all about the relationship between my representations, um, forgetting about the fact that I'm using them to refer to an object. Whereas the transcendental function or real function of the understanding is to take a concept and use it to unify. Um, the manifold of sense. And we know that imagination does something interesting, but never mind. So, um, um, but the way the metaphysical deduction works, and that was like ultimately the basis for the transcendental deduction, the, the way the metaphysical deduction worked was to say that these are just two sides of the same coin, right? Like the, the logical function of the understanding can only work because of the real or transcendental function of the understanding. That, I mean, that much is a metaphysical deduction. So it's still subjective in the sense that we're just saying like what most be, what I must be able to do with this concept. The transcendental deduction is then supposed to show that the manifold given in the sense must allow me to do it. So, um, so that's why in this case, um, there's a there is or is supposed to be a complete correspondence between the logical function of understanding and judgment and the transcendental function of the understanding in the categories, right? Like the different ways that a rule can be applied on a condition are the same as. The different ways that the manifold of sense can be um, unified as falling under a condition. So, yeah, we want to say the same thing about reason. Um, And the question is, um, so like if I can summarize the result of the transcendental deduction as saying that every empirical concept must be able to represent its object as falling under the categories, that is, as one, many, total, um, real, 
negative, limited, et cetera. Um, so now what we want to say is something like, um, what, what, what I guess what we're asking here is something like, so, okay, how must every empirical judgment represent its object if it's going to be possible to unify the case it's applied to by the unity of reason. That is to provide a unified explanation for it. Right, so just as you know, the question before was how must every empirical concept be able to represent its object if it's going to be possible to, to make judgments about that object? The question here seems like it would be how must every empirical judgment represent its object if it's going to be possible to explain that judgment by a principle? But um, I think you can see why the analogy is going to break down. Because the judgment is only a medium representation of anything. The judgment is, right, like the judgment as a whole, yeah, what it's about is the object of A. But it doesn't represent the object of A directly. Rather, instead of, um, of doing that, it supplies a higher representation that, that A is going to fall under. So um, it doesn't really represent anything about its object other than that it's B. So how can it possibly represent its object as explainable by a certain principle? Now, I mean, like in the understanding case, the answer was the concept can represent its object as other than just falling under its condition because the concept represents its object as like the whole thing that falls under this experience. Right, and that's what makes synthetic judgments possible, and so forth. But the the judgment doesn't represent the object directly, so it doesn't represent all those other characteristics that the object has. All it says is that the object of A is B. So there's no room for the judgment to represent the object as having more properties like being explainable in a certain way. So, so, I mean, so I think like, what's the resolution to that problem? And I think the answer is, the real resolution is, yes, the analogy doesn't work. That's why the understanding has a legitimate transcendental or real use, whereas reason doesn't. Reasons transcendental or, or real use, at least in theoretical philosophy, is dialectical. It's illusory. Precisely because this analogy doesn't really work. Um, right? So, I mean, that's what Kant is talking about when he says things like reason never applies directly to objects, it only applies to the judgments of the understanding. 
So it only has a logical force. Again, at least in theoretical philosophy, right? I mean, in Kant's practical philosophy, he has to explain why this very same faculty of reason in, is also the source of moral imperatives, <laughs> like telling you what you ought to do. But, um, but like, so obviously I'm not gonna try to get into that here, but in the theoretical use of reason, it only has, it's only legitimate application is logical. So, um, um, like, Beyond that, I mean, it does do something beyond that, but all it does beyond that is to like urge the understanding to look for the explanation, basically. Um, um, that is to offer up the forms of, it, of explanation, and then it's up to the understanding to find the explanation. Um, like we do, we need the explanations because, like I said, without that unity of reason, we're not exactly saying one thing when we make the judgments, right? So we need it, but there's no guarantee that we have it or we're going to have it. But again, when we try to carry out the analogy and make the make reason like the understanding, so there's going to be something like a transcendental deduction here. We say, well, okay, um, what's going to guarantee that we can always find an explanation? It has to be something about the object. The object of what? Well, the object of the subject concept of, of the conclusion. So something about that is going to guarantee that we always will be able to find an explanation for every empirical judgment. Um, and since, like, this guarantee has to hold for every empirical judgment, um, it's not going to be something about cinema, let's say, right? It's going to be something about any possible object of our experience. That is, it's going to be something about object described just in terms of the categories, the transcendental predicates, the predicates of object as such. So somewhere, like internal, this is what reason is trying to, to explore. I mean, that is, I guess, no, I'm, internal is the categorical, but I think like somewhere guaranteed by falling under the categories is going to be um, um, something that makes explanation possible for every empirical judgment. It guarantees that nothing that's true lacks an explanation. Somewhere in the object. And I think, you know, so this, let me find, actually read something from Kant here. This is on B364. Um, on Kemp Smith, Kemp Smith, page three oh six. Um, Obviously, the principle peculiar to reason in general and its logical employment is to find for the conditioned knowledge obtained through the understanding the unconditioned whereby its unity is brought to completion. I mean, I think what Kant means about that is that the logical employment is like, I mean, of course, at every step that only happens relatively. Right, like regarding this condition itself as unconditioned, but um, but then reason has a has the task of finding another condition that will will explain the condition. Um, so in its logical employment, 
reasons like ongoing task is to find the unconditioned. Um, that explains the conditioned knowledge of the understanding. But then he says, but this logical maxim can only become a principle of pure reason through our assuming that if the condition is given, the whole series of conditions subordinated to one another, a series which is therefore itself unconditioned, is likewise given. That is, it's contained in the object and its connection. So, right, so like the task of, the logical task of reason is to find these conditions that explain our, um, or like I said, when the condition is actually found, it's found by the understanding, which is the judgment or an object, right? But, um, but the, um, um, but the logical employment of reason is to, you know, tell the understanding what to look for, what kind of conditions to look for, what kind of conditions can explain judgments. Um, but the illegitimate analogy with the transcendental uh, deduction leads us to say that um, all of those conditions that reason is going to find, or that reason is going to get the understanding to find, must already be in the object, and that's what guarantees that we'll be able to find them. And again, they must already be in every empirical object. Um, so it's like a series of conditions leading up to the unconditioned must be contained in every empirical object. But contained maybe is the wrong word for it because depending on what type of condition we're talking about. So in the case of an internal condition, we're talking about the object literally containing that series. Right? Like we're saying that everything has to um, contain an internal explanation of whatever could possibly happen to it. Whereas in this case, we're talking about a series of external conditions. So what we're really saying is that for any given empirical object, um, it must be connected by relations to a series of other conditions that make it, um, that explain why it's one way rather than another, basically. Um, and something even more complicated in case of uh, judgment. I don't know how to explain that. Um, well, maybe when I say more like what these, what these series up to the unconditioned are like. Um, So, well, okay, let me actually say one more thing in the abstract, the extreme abstract, and before I try to get down more like what the content of the three ideas therefore is, although that's a part where I don't understand as well. So, um, but um, 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 so the, um, this unconditioned condition isn't something that the understanding can find and experience. 
um, I think this really makes sense because it's a sad reaction. I mean, so first of all, what Kant definitely says about this is experience is always conditioned. Um, right? That is, we never experience an unconditioned, something that's fit to be an unconditioned condition. Um, why is that? Um, think it's because experience so experience means thinking an object based on sensation right remember Kant used Kant used an experience experience is the cognition the empirical cognition of objects so ex experience isn't just sensation experience is the sensibility plus understanding using them together to cognize or know empirical objects um so, um, so experiencing an object means um, recognizing that I can apply a rule to the object because of a principle that's not found in me. Um, Where is the principle? It's in the object that I keep saying, right? Like the object is affecting me. <laughs> um, it's on the condition that the object affects me in the right way that I can bring it under my rule. Um, so I always am representing the object as conditionally falling under this rule, not as absolutely falling under this rule, not as, um, right? Like to do that, that's something I could do if I had an intellectual intuition, right? I could say um, the object must fall under this rule because this rule is what makes the object what it is. This rule creates the object. So the object must fall under it. But with a sensible intuition, all I'm ever saying is on the condition that the object cooperates, I can apply this rule to it. So I think, you know, like I said, I'm not 100% sure. And I'm not slipping between different meanings of conditions or between different places that it's applied or something like that. I think this is the right explanation of why experience is always conditioned. Yeah. It's also you know, passive in the form of passive as much as in our stuff that we are sort of see. Yeah, I think that's the same as what I'm saying, right? It's always on condition that the object does something. I'm always so experience always means applying a rule on the condition that an object does something to me. Um, so I can't represent the object, I can't use my rules to represent the object as definitely following that rule. I can only use them to, to um, represent the object as following that rule if that's it's that kind of object, <laughs> basically, right? So um uh, so when through this transcendental illusion, reason wants to wants me now to think of my object as containing or subject to some unconditioned condition. Um, um, it's automatically trying to get me to use my concepts transcendent. There's, remember, uh, I think I said this last time, that, you know, the transcendental employment of a concept, right? So, like, of a category, which is the only case where this 
really comes up. So the transcendental use of the category is using it, forgetting about the conditions under which we human beings can apply it. Right? So like this is the schema. The schema is the only way we can use the category, but I can abstract from that. And then I then I'm considering the category as transcendental, as applying to objects in general. And uh, um, if I try to use it that way, that's when I get into the type of problem that Leibniz gets into. But the transcendent use of the category is to use it specifically for something that couldn't fall under a schema. That is, so I'm representing something as super sensible as not possibly given in its given. Um, and that is, that's necessarily involved in trying to split the guarantee of a complete series of conditions into the object. So, um, So, like, I'm both regarding the object of experience only through transcendental predicates, right? Like, a, like its particular empirical predicates can't be relevant because it has to be a blanket guarantee to apply to any object of experience. And the guarantee I'm giving, I'm trying to give, is also going to be in terms of some object, and that object also has to be described only using transcendental predicates, that is only using the categories because that object is transcendent. It's not possibly an object of experience. Um, um, so that's why this is all part of transcendental logic. The, trans it's the transcendental dialect. Um, it's the way when you think about the object of experience in general, or uh, tempted or um, naturally impelled to suppose some object, which that which all we can say about it is that it's not an object of experience, that it couldn't. But I mean, that is, we can say that about it using the categories. So, um, but, uh, so, I mean, I keep talking about the series of conditions, you know, like, because as I go back to the categorical syllogism, which is the easiest one to understand. So, like, um, the condition is already hard to know how to, how to write this correctly. But I mean, because what I'm suggesting is that the condition really is C. Right? Like, you know, when Kant describes step by step how this happens, he says, like, in the major premise, the rule is applied on the condition. In the minor premise, a particular case is subsumed under the condition. And in the conclusion, the rule is applied to that particular case. So the condition, actually, in a categorical judgment, is just the middle term, the concept. Um, um, but um, 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 but it's not an unconditioned condition. What does that mean? Well, it means that um, we still need an explanation why A is C.
So like an unconditioned condition, I mean, I think you can't really write this, like judgments aren't worthless. Judgments are about applying a rule on a condition. <laughs> okay, so like the unconditioned condition would be something where you don't you don't have to say that A is C. Um, so there's nothing there to explain. Uh, but so in any case, uh, that like that's never going to appear uh, in this in, in the minor term because like it's judgments aren't like right. So I mean, um, so the minor term is always going to call for an explanation. Now I mean, by the way, so the major term also you know calls for an explanation. I think when Kant talks about the series of prosyllogisms, he's thinking about um, a syllogism whose conclusion is a minor term. I mean, um, not 100% sure of that. I don't know that anything actually, I used to think this was a bigger question than I now think. I think for a reason that I'm about to say, it's not so important how he thinks about it, the series of prosyllogisms. Maybe there's two series of prosyllogisms, or actually an infinite number of branching ones, right? If you can, you know, you can prove, you can ask to prove the minor term or the major term. And then, so like, let's say you want to prove. The one you want to prove is the minor term. So now you're going to need syllogism like this. B is the condition of the condition. Uh, right? Like, what makes this particular case fall under the condition C, it's this other condition B. Um, so, I mean, um, and then going back in the series, you're going to need another one whose conclusion is A is C and so on and so forth. I, I think that's the best way to think about what's going on, but like I said, I'm not sure. Maybe the whole, maybe Todd is thinking of a whole series branching off here. The whole series branching off here and one is a branch pitch. But he always talks as if it's just one series, right? Um, so anyway, um, right? I mean, this also makes it easier to understand when you get to let's say the disjunctive syllogism. So uh, uh, so And now you want a syllogism whose conclusion is C is B. I'm sorry, this is a hypothetical syllogism. So, I mean, you could give a categorical syllogism here. Again, he seems to merely think about series where each syllogism is the same type as the others. But, I mean, so you could definitely do that, right? You just say, like, Right, and then you can just give a series of hypothetical syllogisms. And like the reason this is easy is because the hypothetical syllogisms are ones where the major premise is hypothetical, but the minor premise and the conclusion are, are, are still categorical, or at least they can be. Right, so like well, you can that's why you can keep this series going without having to worry about syllogisms whose conclusion. Is hypothetical. Um, all right. Again, I probably said more about that than I should have. But um, so, but what I was going to say is um, so, in the logical employment of reason, strictly speaking, there always, there really is a series. 
right? It's like I said, you know, uh, the first syllable is never enough to guarantee the conclusion is true. You always have to explain why the condition applies. So you always like are going back and back and back from one syllable to another. Um, in the, I don't know how to describe this. It, I said before, this is really still logical, but maybe I should say it's transcendental, but it's the correct transcendental employment, but I don't know why I talk transcendental. But anyway, like when reason is doing the right thing to the understanding, um, I mean, I guess maybe it really is the same series, so to speak. It's just a different way of looking at it. Again, there's always a series because what reason is always doing, trying to understand it to do is to look for another condition. And that will never be the end of the story, right? So like, explain why cinnabar is toxic. Well, it's a compound of mercury. Why are compounds of mercury toxic? Right, so now the understanding is off on another quest to find the condition that explains that. Um, so, uh, okay, I guess that was explaining the major premise. So, just, but never mind. Anyway, um, uh, so again, in that that employment of reason, which I kind of call regulatory, where it tells the understanding not to stop but to keep looking for conditions, that there really is a series. And, or, or say, but in the incorrect transcendental employment of reason, in general, there isn't a series. Because in general, what the, you know, like no series here is going to, is going to ever, in the object, is going to ever do what reason wants. So, um, so, like, what it does is, is to tell the understanding to go in one step from any empirical object to the unconditioned. Um, so, it's like this whole series of gross syllogisms and the logical employment of reason really corresponds to just one demand. That reason makes in its in its illegitimate transcendental employment. It just says, look, to make this whole series always possible, understanding you must think an unconditioned condition of all empirical objects. Um, this, I mean, I think. In the so when we talk about the three transcendental ideas, which I guess uh, I guess I can just call it the three transcendental ideas are the soul, the world, and God. So in the part that's about the soul, which is the called the paralogisms of pure reason, and in the part that's about God, which is called the ideal of pure reason. In these parts, uh, it's easy to remain clear about what I just said, because he does talk about a series, right? Like, the soul is the absolute subject, period. It's not like it's the subject of the subject of the subject of the subject or something like that, right? Um, so, um, but in this part, that's called the antinomy. It does get confusing because since we're talking about the world here, we're talking about something that actually has a series. Of And what reason is going to ask the understanding to do is to represent that series as complete. So it's still really only one step, right? But it's one step from like 
the series, the way it really is, that is always incomplete to an unconditioned version of the same series. Um, so like since there there is a series here, it's easy to get confused and think that that series is this series, but it's really not. Um, I mean it's it's related to this series because it's it's asking for like um, a single total guarantee of something. Um, but the single total guarantee isn't itself like um, got to by going back through a series or something like that. Um, the, the fact that here we're talking about conditioned and unconditioned versions of the same thing is why in this case, there's gonna be an antinomy. That is, this is gonna lead to contradictions. In these two cases, we don't get contradictions. Concepts, right? We just get a like a illegitimate prompting on the part of reason to think about a certain kind of object that can never be given an experience. In this case, it's the rational soul, and in this case, it's God, right? And Kant says the transcendental the, the, uh, illusion just causes us to think that we know about an object like that. Um. um but here it's going to cause problems like, on the one hand, it causes us to think that the world must have a beginning in time. And on the other hand, it causes us to think that the world couldn't possibly have a beginning in time. Um, I think the term dialectic, so we know what Kant thinks dialectic means, right? Dialectic is so strictly speaking, dialectic is like the art of using apparently logical arguments to draw invalid conclusions, right? Like dialectic is sophistry. But Kant says, of course, that's not what I mean when I say part of my logic is dialectic. <laughs> um, right, he says that's an art that's already too well known to metaphysical jugglers or something like that. Right, the dialectic is the part that is about that, you know, what makes that illusion happen. Um, it doesn't have anything to do with like opposite things going back and forth against each other. Like we tend to think that dialectic must mean something like that. We try to tend to think that dialogue, right? When we when we oppose the dialogue, we oppose monologue to dialogue. Like we think there's a two in here, right? Like we think this means two something, but it's it really actually doesn't. This is you know like in Greek. This doesn't mean two, this means like through <laughs> the preposition. Dia lege. So dia lege means kind of like to talk through. Um, now, like how that can come to me and what Kant wants to mean, I don't know, but the point is it doesn't actually have a two. In it. This is from the same Indo-European word root as, as the word for two, but that's not what it means in Greek. So yeah, so I mean, and I guess the reason I'm emphasizing this is because and I feel like Hegel himself already makes this mistake, actually, which is disappointing in Hegel. But anyway, it's certainly like people who are reading Hegel definitely make this mistake that they they confuse the, they think that the whole dialectic must be about self-contradictions of reason. And that that's what the guy, you know, that it's because there's two different theses, the thesis and the antithesis that contradict each other. But that's really only true in this part, not true in these two parts. Um, all right. So the only other thing, <laughs> Left to say, but five minutes is not enough to say it. Is 
why these three types of search for explanation are supposed to lead to the demand specifically for these three objects. Um, I mean, I guess, you know, when we talk about each of these parts individually, um, I'll try to say more about that, but um, I mean, it's somehow, so like, okay, what I'm gonna say now is not really conceptual, it's kind of like just pointing to a diagram <laughs> without explaining it. But remember that when I wrote the table of categories, and this is like in the PDF that I put up that you can check. Um, I kind of, I asked like, okay, so why are there three headings? But there's, I mean, why are there three moments, but there's four headings? Like, is there, a, is there threeness important in one direction and the fourness in the other direction? And I ended up just saying that it's that, no, not really. Because it really, like, it really works like this. There's subjective transcendental conditions. And then there's subjective ones. Those subjective ones are those three convertible transcendentals one, true, and good. Then there's the objective categories quality, quantity, and relation that are about the real determinations of the object. And finally, there's modality, which is about relation of the object to the subject. So you see that like these three ideas, so and so what I'm when and what I claim furthermore is that this one, two, three is like this one, two, three. Right, but this is like internal. This is like going out from itself. And this is like coming back, adding everything back up to itself. So, um, um, so if that's true, it kind of makes sense, right? That we can write so. World. Now, why do you get God here? So, I mean, I think the answer is that a subject that could really, you know, to which the whole world in its totality could really revert would be God. Um, it's like a sign, I think, that you've made a mistake if you really can't think of these as the same subject. Um, right? We can't think of these as the same subject because this one doesn't have an intellectual intuition. It doesn't have an intellectual in intuition. Its object doesn't, like, its object always has more in it than it put into it, so to speak. Um, so, um, so I think, like, roughly speaking, that's why when we look for an absolute internal condition, we look for an absolute subjective condition. Um, I mean, Yes, is this another way of saying the same thing, or is this a different argument? I have too many arguments. But I guess you could also say something like remember in the transcendental deduction, the one object that I'm guaranteed that I have an empirical representation of is myself, the object of inner sense. 
I think that's just a manifestation of the same thing, but I can't look it out <laughs> clearly in zero minutes. So anyway, so like that's why here we look for an absolute subject. Here we when when we're looking for external an unconditioned external explanation, we look for it in the object. And then here, when you're looking for whatever kind of explanation this is, we look for it in a in a subject that would be equal to all possibilities. We are the moon. Um, all right. I I actually have to go because we have a colloquium and we're going to be late for it. But <laughs> uh, anyway. Uh, so thank you. I'll see you.